These are my top 10 books of all time. I have never done this. Whenever anybody asks me what my favorite book is, I fumble around and I pick one, two, three, four, five books that I've enjoyed in the past or whatever. Whenever I sit down to pick out my ultimate fave, I'm just overwhelmed. And so I've never done it. But I decided today is the day I'm picking out my top 10 favorites. So let's go! As I said, this was a very hard exercise for me when I went to my bookshelf and started picking out my top 10 favorites. I spent about an hour looking through all my books and I ended up with maybe 20 books on my top 10 and I had to whittle it down and it took me a long time, but I've decided to include four honorable mentions here because I just couldn't leave them off the list, but they didn't quite slide into my top 10. The ones that did make it into my top 10, they all have extra stories that go along with them that make them a little bit more personal to me. They mean something to me and they've sort of shaped who I am as a reader and even as a person. So that's how I decided what was gonna make my top 10. So here are my four honorable mentions. Number one is Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go. And I talk about this book a lot when people ask me what my favorite is. This is often on the list, mostly because people know it. It's easy to pitch as a great novel with a twist. And I just love Ishiguro's work. You can tell people it has a movie and all that stuff. I just love the slow burn of this, the beauty of Ishiguro's writing. Everything he writes is so beautiful and slow, but it keeps you turning pages even though it's so slow and that's what's so beautiful about Ishiguro. It doesn't make sense how good he is and how slowly he reveals things but you still want to turn the pages to figure out what's happening and that's why I love Ishiguro's work. Next is a book I read fairly recently. I think I read it in 2020. It is The Folded Clock by Heidi Julevitz. Heidi Julevitz. I just love this book. It blends all kinds of genres. It's called A Diary. In the bookstore I found it in the memoir section online. They sometimes called it autobiography but it's also included on auto fictional lists of best auto fictional novels so some people think it's fictionalized version of Heidi's life and it's just I don't know it's beautiful it is two years worth of diary entries that she's curated into this it's not quite every day but she starts each section saying today I did this and it turns into a, a meditation about life and living and the, the reasons we do things, all of the mundane things like building a birthday cake or going to the doctor for a physical or watching the finale of The Bachelorette. It's just very plain and simple, but it turns into a philosophical meditation and it's beautiful. Next is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. This is a popular book. Everyone's heard of it. It's about two girls growing up in Italy and it spans their entire life it's five volumes or whatever i've only read two of them but i just love this book and the detail it goes into and the portrait of a friendship and all of the turmoil it goes with friendship as well as love and connection and how you can be rivals at one minute but best friends at the other and you care about each other and it's just a really great i love it i don't know what to say and my last honorable mention number four is The Blazing World by Siri Hustfed. Hustfed. This is just an amazing novel that I think about all the time. It's about a woman who is an artist who feels like she is not taken seriously as an artist, as a woman. So she does a sort of performing art thing where she hires three different men to present her artwork as their own to see what kind of reception they'll get and what sort of praises and whatever else. And each of those three men become famous because of the art that they created, even though it was the woman who created it. And it's just formally, it's written as a bunch of documents about the woman because she has passed away before the book has started. And uh, it, there's some intrigues as, as far as one of the artists ends up be, betraying her and claiming the art as his own and all of this stuff. It's just a great novel and I think about it all of the time. It's a feminist tome about the ways we sort of disrespect women author, uh, women authors and artists and all of that. So I just love this book, but didn't quite make my top 10. 
But enough about the honorable mentions. Let's get to the real deal. This is my number 10 favorite, Saga. Yes, I am including a comic in my top 10 favorites because I make the rules and I don't care what you say. Saga, I started reading this, I think it was 2015, maybe 2016. After I finished Stranger Things season one and just loved it so much, I read an article online that said, things to read if you are missing Stranger Things. And in that article, they suggested I read Paper Girls, who is written by the same author, Brian K. Vaughn. So I read that and consumed all of it and loved it and I wanted more. So then I found that, oh, he's written this thing and it's much larger than Paper Girls. And when I picked this up, oh my God, I could not believe it. This is a intergalactic space odyssey adventure with all kinds of political intrigue and philosophical diatribes. And it's about a planet whose moon is at war with them. But one person on the planet falls in love with someone on the moon and they make a baby. And because of the centuries-long narrative of how everyone believes that these people hate each other and there's nothing they can do about it, it's just the way it is. We are constantly at war. The fact that they have this love child, everyone in the galaxy is after that child to kidnap it or kill it or get rid of it because it's proof that the narrative that has been pitched at everyone for centuries is not all it's cracked up to be and it's maybe not even true so there's lots in here about pacifism versus war with about the nature of humanity it is full of all kinds of diverse characters there's trans representation here there's queer representation here there's all kinds of diverse characters from all over the globe slash galaxy and it's just amazing and on top of all that the art you could just look through this even if you didn't know how to read this would just be amazing i love saga and it's my number 10. number nine is the life of pi i always say this is one of my favorite books not because i think it's one of the best i've ever written though it is very good I read it in 2006, and at that time I was at the very beginning of a years-long existential crisis in which my whole world that I had been brought up in and grown up in was flipping upside down, and I was starting to question what is real, what is true, what do I believe, and all of these things. And I read Life of Pi at the beginning of that sort of learning curve, and what it did for me was it made me want to become a writer. If you don't know, I am a writer, and my first book is due to be published in November. And before I read this book, I had always been a writer since, like, 10th grade when my teacher made me write a poem for a contest, and I liked that enough that I kept writing. But when I read this book, it was the first time I became aware as the writer behind the story, aware of the writer behind the story, and it made me want to do that. I thought, I want to do that. And I decided to take myself seriously as a writer, and I got to it. I started writing every day and writing different things and reading about writing and reading more and more literature. This led me on a path that if I hadn't read this book, I may have become a writer anyway. I had always done it and loved it and wished I could do it. But this pushed me towards that faster than I would have otherwise. And I love Life of Pi. Number eight is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. May he rest in peace. And you know, well, lots, of, lots of people love this book, but many people hate this book for whatever reason. For me, I read it when my son was two years old. That means it was 2011. And it's about, it's a post-apocalyptic story about one man making sure his son is safe as they traipse across America to find safety in this post-apocalyptic world in which everyone has lost their minds. There's nothing to eat. People are eating babies. People are killing each other. People are stealing every chance they get. And this one man has to keep his little son safe as they walk across America. And it just blew me away. I remember le reading deep into the night. And then when I finished it, I crawled into bed with my son and sort of just cried myself to sleep as I held him. And so it stuck with me. Again, it's one of the ones on my rotating list of five or six or however many when just I happen to be in a conversation where people ask me my favorite, The Road is one that I can pop off the top of my head. It's one of only five or six books that have made me cry real tears in my life, and I love it. 
Number seven is Ann Tyler's Back When We Were Grown Ups. I love Ann Tyler's work, but this is the first I read of hers shortly after I read Life of Pi, and sh shortly after I went back to university to get my English Lit degree. This was one of the first books I picked up on my own without anyone telling me what to read outside of the bubble that I grew up in. I was just at the store picking out books with my big boy pants on all alone, and the cover looked interesting, and the title was very interesting, and I just read it, and I have been in love with Ann Tyler's work ever since. She's just a beautiful writer. She's able to take the mundanity of life, normal characters with normal problems, with everyday relationship issues or whatever, and turn it into a profound story that is meaningful, at least to me. I think you should read Ann Tyler. She does not write page turners. You will not stay up late into the night wondering what's going to happen next. But if you're into character-driven novels about everyday people living everyday lives, then she's the woman for you. This one is about a woman in her 60s who is coming to the realization that for much of her life, she has simply been playing roles that have been assigned to her by society or by her husband or by her family. And when she was a young 19-year-old, she was very confident and ready to tackle the world. And then she married, fell in love and got married, and then just became a mother and then a grandmother. And she's at a point in her life now where she's questioning everything. Who am I really? I don't even know who I am because I've never made a decision for myself over the past 40-ish years. I have only made decisions based on the roles that I was assigned to play. And it's her dealing with that and tackling that and working on her relationships with her husband, with her family, with her cousins and aunties and all of these things. It's just a beautiful, profound novel. Number six. This is All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Taves. When I read this book, I was in the middle of a desperate reading slump. I was in the middle of a huge depressive episode. Actually, it was before I had ever talk, spoken to a doctor about my mental health issues, before I had even read anything about being depressed or trying to deal with that and cope with that in any healthy manner. So I was just down in the dumps. And this is about two sisters. One of them is severely depressed, even though she's living a successful life as a world-renowned pianist who's about to embark on a worldwide tour. And her sister, who is not depressed, but she's living haphazardly, without any vision or goals, sleeping with the wrong kinds of dudes from the outside. One looks successful, the other doesn't. But one is depressed and the other isn't quite depressed, even though she's not exactly happy with her life. But this book just got me exactly where I needed to be got when I read it. And it's about the love of two sisters and the things they'll do to care for each other. And it's about mental health issues and dealing with that in healthy ways and all of these things. It just, when I read this... I couldn't put it down, even though it's also a slow burner. It just made me feel seen. Even though I am neither of these women, I am not like either of these women. The book made me feel seen as far as mental health issues go and the way I was struggling. And I, it was one of the things that was a catalyst for making me seek help with my mental health. I love Miriam Taves. I've read everything she's written since this book came out. And I've made my way through some of her back catalog, but I haven't made it through all of them because she writes a lot of books but you could do worse than picking up all my puny sorrows by miriam taves all right are you ready for my top five favorite books of all time man this was hard and these five books i could probably swap in and out as top last whatever but these are my five favorites i'm gonna go through them now number five is gilead by marilyn robinson and if you have not met read Marilyn Robinson, you need to stop what you're doing and go read her right now. She writes the most beautiful books on earth. If there's one author I wish I could write like novel-wise, it's Marilyn Robinson. Gilead is the first in a series. I think there's four books now, maybe five. But this one is about an old man who has been a preacher his whole life. He married a younger woman and they have a young son. And the old man is nearing the end of his days and he's writing a letter to his son explaining his life, explaining the things he believes, ex explaining what he believes it is to be a good human, to be a good man, to be a good person and all of this. And even though it's religious based, 
it doesn't come off as preachy at all. In fact, I think it leans the other way. I, I read this in the middle of all of that turmoil where I was trying to go up and down and figure out what I believed was true. And this was one that I just thought, if I could write this book, I could die a happy man. This is exactly the kind of, this is the book I want to read. And I, I gave this to my dad as a gift once, and it was one of the only books he ever read that I had given him. And we were able to talk about it and sort of bond over it. And I just love this book, and I love Marilyn Robinson's work. Number four is A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. And this book changed my life as a writer. I had been writing short stories, trying to work on a collection. When I read this, it's called a novel, but it is a series of short stories. And it spans decades. And you meet characters at one point in time, and then you forget about them for five or six stories. And then all of a sudden, there's that character again, and it's 20 years later, and he's doing all kinds of different things. But the story before just makes so much more clear what is happening in this story. And it does that all the way through. There's characters here that turn up here. There's characters in this story that turn up in this story that has nothing to do with them, but they're just sort of on the outskirts of that story. And I just thought it was wild. And formally, I was like, I want to do this. And this has been the blueprint for my book, Grandview Drive, which is coming out in November, which is a series of collected, connected stories in which the characters, yeah, just like this, show up here, and then they show up later in totally different con context. And I base that on this book. I didn't try to copy this. The content is nothing the same. Egan is so much more smarter than I am, and she talks about music and art in a way that I could never. But my book would not be out in the world as it is without this book, A Visit from the Goon Squad, and I have read this three times, and I think I'm going to read it again very soon. Number three. We're getting down to it. Number three is In the Garden of the North American Martyrs by Tobias Wolff. And honestly, I could choose any of Tobias Wolff's books. He writes short fiction. He also writes novels, but I haven't read any of his novels because I love his short fiction so much. And I think short fiction is the purest form of art there is. He has written one of my favorite stories of all time called A Bullet in the Brain, which is not in this collection. It's in The Night in Question. But this collection, for whatever reason, it's short, and I have read it. I can't tell you how many times. Some of the stories I've probably read 15 times. He just writes a perfect short story with the perfect amount of mystery, perfect amount of uncomfortableness. I believe every short, good short story makes you a little bit uncomfortable because the character is so far outside of your experience that you're forced to imagine your, what you would do in that situation or whatever they're just the right amount of ambiguous where at the end of the story you sort of have to figure out what is going to happen or you get to decide which way the story will end the stories just move past the final period and get lodged in your brain and i love tobias wolf because of that and this is my favorite of his collections number two is alice monroe and runaway is my favorite of her collections Alice Munro, I think, is my favorite author. For sure, top two, as you'll see. And her short stories, similar to Tobias Wolf, are just perfect, even though their styles are completely different. Alice Munro, like Ann Tyler, speaks to the mundanity of life, everyday people with everyday problems, dealing in everyday relationships, and trying to figure out what it means to be a person, what it means to be a person in a relationship, whether that's family, uh, brother or sister, or m husband and wife, or mother and daughter. She's just looking at relationships with, an, with a telescope or a microscope and dealing with all of the mundane, menial tasks that we have to do. Alice Monroe is the best short story writer living, maybe ever, in my opinion. Her short stories can sometimes be 80 pages long, but they still feel like short fiction. They don't move into the novel or novella mode. They're doing exactly what short stories do, and that is examining lonely characters who feel like they're on the outskirts of society or who feel ostracized in some way, and they are figuring out how to move into a connected place with other people. And even a story that's 80 pages long, there is not a word 
or a piece of punctuation out of place. Everything is doing what it needs to do, what, what Alice Monroe has decided she needs. And there's no extraneous purpley language at all. You can't skip over anything. You just find Alice Monroe stories are perfect in every way. And Runaway, so far, is my favorite of her collections. The one I've read the most. I love it. And number one. Number one is How Should a Person Be by Sheila Hetty. And I went back and forth over and over. Should I, be, should I pick this one or Motherhood by Sheila Hetty, the same author? They are both such tremendous, big, smart thoughtful books and i love motherhood and i've read it more than i've read this one there's just so much in motherhood to to pick at and to think about dealing with time and being a parent being a mother what does it mean to bring life into this world what does it mean to create art what does it mean to live your life as an artist but i think maybe this one is even a little bit more of my favorite it's dealing with many of the same things though at this point this came much before motherhood. She's not talking about motherhood or parenthood as much as she's talking about being an artist. And what does it mean to live life as art? And are we able to live life as art? And it's talking about, well, how should a person be? That's the title. And how, mostly how should a friend be? She's friends with a woman in the story and she's desperate to be best friends with her. And they grow this friendship and she, Sheila, the main character, does all these things that she believes is what a good friend would do. And turns out Margo, her friend, confronts her and says, I don't think that's exactly what I needed or wanted from a friend. And she has to deal with this, all of this stuff. It is auto-fictional. Sheila is the main character, even though Hetty says it's not her real life. But all of the characters in it are real Googleable people that you can find online. They're artists and they have exhibits in Toronto and all of this stuff. And when I read it in snippets as I was working at chapters and sneaking off to the stacks to read when there were no customers around, I read it in one or two pages at a time. I just fell in love with the form. I was blown away with who, how is this a novel when Sheila's the main character? It felt like a memoir or a true story. And it led me on this path of reading autofiction. I've been obsessed with it ever since I read this book. And it, the way it blurs fiction with nonfiction, it just changed my life in a way not many books have. So I think this must be my favorite book. In fact, my second book, which is a novel, is called That's Me in the Corner, and it is straight-up autofictional based on the form of this book and the many others I've read since then. But Tim is the main character, even though I am not really the main character, but it's based on my life about a young boy growing up in a fundamentalist evangelical home and eventually straying away and trying to explain his life and his decisions to his mother and his family throughout the book. And if I hadn't read this, and this hadn't pushed me into this new auto-fictional obsession that I had, I never would have been able to find Ocean Wong, or Carl Nosgaard, or Chris Krauss, or Ben Lerner, or any of these, these books that inspired my whole novel. And I never would have written that novel. I had been trying for 10 years, starting and stopping, starting and stopping and starting over, but when I read this, and then that led me to those ones, I was able to break free and finish that book. And hopefully, that one will be published next year. What? Those are my top 10 novels. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining Tim Black It Reads on BookTube. I am new here, and I am just getting used to this platform. I make a lot of videos over on the Clock app, so if you want to join me over there, I am more comfortable over there. But if you want to just join me here... I make longer videos here. I would love it if you push subscribe. And I will see you next time.